Hello viewers, welcome to my channel. Hope you are enjoying all my videos. Let's start with test 7. Question number 1. Where would you find types of components in a clock radio? Option A. Routing sheet. Option B. Master production schedule. Option C. Bill of material. Option D. Resource requirements planning. Let's evaluate option A. Routing sheet. Now, before we start, let me rephrase this question for you so that everybody can understand this question. In this particular question, examiner wants to know what kind of components or parts are used in manufacturing a clock radio. Now, option A says routing sheet. A, a routing sheet is a document which lists the exact sequence of operations needed to complete the job therefore it has nothing to to do with the components of a clock radio let's see what we have in option b master production schedule master production schedule or mps is the process that helps manufacturers plan which products and related quantities to produce during certain periods therefore you will not find list of components in mps as well Okay, now let's move on to option C, bill of material. Let me define bill of material for you. A bill of material or bomb is a centralized source of information used to manufacture a product. It is a list of the items needed to create a product as well as the instructions on how to assemble that product. I think it is quite evident that this is the correct answer for this question. Anyway, let's just have a, a look at option D as well. Option D says resource requirements planning. RRP. RRP deals with requirement of productive resources including machine equipment, workers and fund based on the production plan. Please don't mix it with the bill of material. Bill of material deals with the components or the ingredients or the parts required to build a product. Whereas resource requirement planning deals with the resources like machine, equipment, workers and fund required to produce the product. Hope this is clear now. Option C is the right answer for this question. Question 2. Lot for lot replenishment is most appropriate for which types of orders? Option A. Large infrequent orders. Option B. Any independent demand items. Option C. Infrequent orders of varying sizes. Option D, orders in a just-in-time GID shop. Now, before we begin evaluating all the options, first we should find out the definition of lot-for-lot lot replenishment. Lot-for-lot lot replenishment is a, is a set number of products that are ordered to cover the demand within a specific time frame, taking lead time for orders into consideration. In other words, um, you can say that a lot-for-lot lot lot replenishment means that Raw material is procured as per the actual demand for a particular period. Not a single unit is ordered extra. Now let's evaluate option A which says that lot for lot replenishment is most appropriate for large and frequent orders. It's a general statement. You can order, uh, you can do lot for lot replenishment for large, medium or small infrequent orders too. Lot for lot replenishment is simply a type of replenishment technique and it has nothing to do with the size or number of the orders. So this is not the appropriate choice here. Let's evaluate option B. Option B says that lot for lot replenishment is most appropriate for any independent demand items. As I told you that lot for lot replenishment is simply a type of a replenishment technique which can be used for both dependent and independent demand items. It has nothing to do with the nature of the product. So this is not the right answer too. Let's see what we have in option C. Infrequent orders of varying sizes. As discussed few minutes ago in option A, a lot for lot replenishment is simply a type of replenishment technique and it has nothing to do with the size or number of the orders. Therefore, this is not the right option too. Let's see what we have in option D. Uh, orders in a just-in-time GIT shop. Since we have reached the last option, therefore it is quite evident that this is the correct answer. Anyway, let's start with the definition of just-in-time. Just-in-time or GIT is an inventory management method in which goods are received from suppliers 
only as they are needed. The main objective of this method is to reduce inventory holding costs and increase inventory turnover. Please don't get confused between lot for lot terminology and just in time. There is a thin line difference between the two. Just in time is associated with the timing and arrival of the goods. Whereas lot for lot, lot replenishment is related to the quantity of the goods. I hope it doesn't require much explanation. It is true that lot for lot replenishment is most appropriate for just in time orders. Question three, what is the plan that provides in effect a contractual agreement ensuring salespeople that they can make delivery promises. Option A Distribution Resources Plan DRP Master Production Schedule MPS Option C Material Requirements Planning MRP Option D Sales and Operation Plan SNOP Okay, let's start with Option A Distribution Resource Plan DRP Let me define DRP for you first DRP is defined as planning of the key resources contained in a distribution system like warehouse, space, money, truck, freight, cars, etc. There is no association between distribution, resor distribution resources plan and delivery promises made by salespeople. So this is not the correct answer. Let's see what we have in option B. Master production schedule MPS. MPS is the process that helps manufacturers plan which products and related quantities to produce during certain period. This is the information which is required by salespeople to make delivery promises. Therefore, this is the correct answer. It is quite logical that if salespeople are unaware of the production schedule, then they will not be able to schedule their activities. Let's just have at option C and D as well to ensure that we have made the right choice. Option C says material requirement plan MRP. Okay, MRP is a technique that uses bill of material data, inventory data and the master production schedule to calculate requirements for material. Salespeople has nothing to do with the arrangement of raw material. Therefore, this is not the correct choice too. Sales and operation plan SNOP. SNOP is a process to develop tactical plans that provide management the ability to strategically direct its business to achieve competitive advantage on a continuous basis by integrating customer focused marketing plans for new and existing products with the management of the supply chain. The primary target of the of SNOP process is to determine what and how much your customers are going to buy and your capability to meet this demand. A second target of the of SNOP process is to align plans with the financial goals of the company. Salespeople do help in SNOP plan, but SNOP plan does not provide information related to quantities in production. Therefore, this is not the right choice too. Option B, MPS is the correct answer for this question. Question 4, which of the following conditions is generally associated with lot for lot replenishment? Option A, master scheduling. Option B, large batches. Option C, just in time GIT manufacturing. Option D, safety stock buffers. We have just discussed a similar question a few moments, moments ago in question number two, but I have just incorporated it here again. So it just gives you a flavor of how questions can be asked in a different way by in a test. It is quite evident that the answer is JIT just in time. So we are going to move on to the next question with, without spending much time on question number four. Question five. A manufacturer that uses material requirement planning wants to schedule all necessary orders for the materials needed to manufacture the products. Where can the list of components and quantities required for the product being manufactured be found? Option A planning factors, option B master production schedule MPS, option C inventory status, option D bill of material bomb. Let's evaluate all the options. Options A says planning factors. It is a made up term. You can easily identify these kind of terms in a glance. This, and therefore, um, this is not the correct um, option here. Let's move on to option B, master production schedule MPS. Let me define MPS again for you. Master production schedule or MPS is the process that helps manufacturers plan which products and related quantities to produce during certain period. There is a thin line difference between the question and MPS. Question is asking you to advise where will you find the list of components and quantities to manufacture a, to manufacture a product. 
whereas mps tells you which products and in, in how quantity in how much quantities to produce during certain period let me elaborate again for my viewers question is asking you to advise where will you find the ingredients to manufacture a product whereas mps gives you production information about the whole product and related quantities so this is not an appropriate answer too let's see what we have in option c inventory status you cannot find out the ingredients to manufacture the product by checking the inventory status so this is absolutely you know irrelevant choice here option d since we are left with uh, with option d only therefore it is quite evident that option d is the right answer anyway let me just define bill of material for you again a bill of material bomb is a centralized source of information used to manufacture a product it is a list of the items and associated quantities to create a product as well as the instructions on how to assemble that product i believe this de definition has answered the question bill of material provides the list of components and quantities required for the product being manufactured so this is the correct answer question 6 which is an independent demand item option a one of the motorcycle wheels on a finished bike option b car radio imported for use in new vehicles option c automobiles tires for stock in a tire shop option d trouser pockets now before we begin evaluating all the options i would advise all my viewers to be extra vigilant while listening to me this is a very important concept and sometimes people make blunders if they fail to understand the core concept this particular question is technical and has a thin line difference between all the given options so let's start let me differentiate or define dependent and de uh, dependent and independent demand items first Independent demand is the demand for a finished good such as a car while dependent demand is the demand for a component part of a finished good such as the tires of a car dependent demand is derived from the demand for a finished good thus if the independent demand for a car is 100 vehicles then the associated dependent demand will be 400 tires assuming 4 tires per car option A suggests that one of the motorcycle wheels on a finished bike can be an independent demand which is absolutely wrong since bike is incomplete without wheels so wheels have a dependent demand this is not the right choice let's move on to option b option b says that car radio imported for use in new vehicles has independent demand absolutely wrong there is a thin line difference between dependent and, in, and independent demand. It is specifically mentioned in this option that the radio was imported for use in new vehicles, which makes a car radio dependent demand. Whereas it if it was mentioned that car radio is imported for vehicles, then it would have been considered as independent demand since shopkeeper, shopkeeper can also sell it as a separate product, as a separate finished product. Hence the keyword new vehicles is differentiating between the two concepts of dependent and independent demand. Let's move on to option B. Automobile tires for stock in a tire shop. It is specifically mentioned in option C that automobile tires are ordered for stock in a tire shop, which means that the tire shop will that the tires will be sold separately as a finished product. Therefore, tires have an independent demand. Therefore, this is, a, this is the right answer. Let me el elaborate a little more for my viewers. If this option would have stated that tires are imported for new vehicles, as we discussed in option B about the car radio imported for use in new vehicles, then these tires will fall under the dependent demand. But since it is clearly mentioned in the option that tires are procured or imported for a tire shop, therefore it is an independent demand item. For this particular option, I want you to consider yourself a tire shop owner. Since you are not manufacturing cars, tires are the finished product for you. You will be selling tires to someone with an old vehicle wanting to change his tire, car tires. So this is the right answer. Let's have a look at option D as well. Trouser pockets. You can figure it out very easily that trouser pockets has a dependent demand since nobody is going to purchase the trouser pockets separately. If manufacturer is producing 100 trousers, he will require 200 trouser pockets, one for each side. So demand of trouser pockets is dependent upon number of trousers produced. 
viewers if you find value in this video please consider subscribing to my channel and pressing the bell icon thank you let's move on to the next question question 7 an organization normally receives a basic component for a product in a fully assembled state due to a due to a natural disaster it must assemble some of these components itself where would it check to see the raw materials needed to perform this assembly work option a routing file option b multiple um, a multi-level bill of material option c inventory status option d make and buy action plan okay since we have different people from different background and industry therefore i would like to spend few minutes in elaborating this question first in order to explain this question i would like to relate this question with an example of a car manufacturer you all know that there are two basic parts in the car engine and body question is saying that initially you used to receive a basic component let's say that basic component was uh, engine of the car from a supplier in a fully assembled form due to a natural disaster suppliers facility was affected and he is not in a position to supply you the engines anymore which means that now you will have to manufacture the engines uh, in house now in order to manufacture the engine you will we'll first have to find out the ingredients or the components required to build the engine and that's what we have to find out in this question as well so let's evaluate all the options option a routing file routing file consists of process scheduling capacity scheduling scheduled assignments of material needs and manufacturing documents it has nothing to do with the raw material required to build the engine of the car option b multi-level bill of material let's recall the definition of a bill of material a bill of material bomb is a centralized source of information that is required to manufacture a product it is a list of the items needed to create a product as well as the instructions on how to assemble that product this is the complete definition of the bill of material just remember just remember that the bill of material is a document which has a list of parts along with the quantities required to manufacture a specific product or an item let me continue with an example of a car to explain the bill of material consider yourself a car manufacturer now and in order to build a car you will check the bill of material to see which parts are required to manufacture the whole car you will see things like bo body steering wheel dashboard lights indicators windscreen engines nuts and bolts wheels etc etc in the bill of material whereas a multi a multi-level bill of material contains several sub assemblies each of which can also be a single level bomb a multi-level bill of material provides a display of all components that are directly or indirectly used in the parent item in short a single bill of material is the bill of material for the whole for the whole car which includes everything but a multi-level bill of material is the bill of material that suggests which parts are required to build an engine or body of the car now manufacturing a car's engine requires using pistons nuts screws pipes etc etc so multi-level bill of material is the bill of material that lists parts of sub assemblies as well you, you can take an example of a car wheel too. In order to build a car wheel, you, you need to have the rim, tire, tube, air wall, nuts, etc, etc. So where will you find the description of all the, these parts related to a wheel or engine? Obviously in a multi-level bomb. Just remember that multi-level bomb is the bomb that lists parts of assemblies, components and sub-parts required to make a complete product represented in a parent-child top-down method. In other words, you can say in a multi-level bomb, you will find the list of parts required to build child items as well. Therefore, this is the correct answer. Since you know the whole concept now, I believe there is no point discussion option C, option C and D. Inventory status and make and buy action both are irrelevant choices here. Let's move on to the next question. Question 8. What is the relationship of acquisition cost to the total cost of ownership for most items? Option A. Acquisition cost is about half of the total cost on average. Option B. Acquisition cost is the major portion of the total cost. Option C. Acquisition cost is a very small portion of the total cost. Option D. Acquisition cost is not relevant. First, we should find out what is acquisition cost and the total cost of ownership. Acquisition cost is the cost required to obtain or one or more units of an item. Formula of acquisition cost is simply unit price multiplied by quantity. 
total cost of ownership is the sum of the purchase price of an asset plus operating cost for its lifetime. For example, let's say you have bought 100 machines for dollar 100 each. So total acquisition cost for 100 machine is dollar 10,000. Now, in order to find out the total cost of ownership, you'll have to incorporate other operating expenses in this acquisition cost like storage, uh, transportation, warehousing, electricity to drive the total cost of ownership. Now, let's evaluate all the option. Option A says acquisition cost is about half of the total cost on average. Now, while discussing the definition of acquisition cost just few minutes before, we have found out that there are several other types of cost uh, like storage, transportation, warehousing, etc, etc associated with the product other than the acquisition cost. Therefore, saying that acquisition cost is about half of the total cost on average is not true. So let's see what we have in option B. Acquisition cost is the major portion of the total cost. I would like to repeat my statement that we have found out while discussing acquisition costs that there are several other types of costs like storage, warehouse, transportation, etc, etc associated with the product. Therefore, saying that acquisition cost is the major portion of the total cost is not true as well. Option C, acquisition cost is a very small portion of the total cost. This is true about acquisition cost. Let me explain you with the help of an example. Let's say you supply car engines to a car manufacturer. Now, in order to store these 100 engines, you need to have a warehouse with all the utilities, security arrangement, loading and unloading vehicle and staff to look after the warehouse. Your acquisition cost of engine is small, but your operating expense to store these engines for one year will be quite high. Therefore, acquisition cost is a very small portion of the total cost. Also note that damaged, theft or expired products adds up to the total cost. So option C, acquisition cost is a very small portion of the total cost is the right answer for this question. Let's just have a look at option D as well. Option D says acquisition cost is not relevant. It is relevant, but it is very, uh, very small portion of the total cost. Question nine, which types of components would be the riskiest to outsource? Option A, commodity. Option B, non-essential. Option C, integral. Option D, modular. Now, let's evaluate all the options. Option A says commodity. If your product has become a commodity, then there is no harm outsourcing it. Since there is no secret recipe for manufacturing that product. When we call any product a commodity, that, then it means that we are talking about a product that is in a maturity stage and has already captured the market. Let's say if you are a renowned uh, bread manufacturer, then you can outsource the production to a third party without any risk of a third party producing the same. Even if the third party manufacturer copies the design and start producing its own bread, he will not be able to sell it because of not being an established brand name in the market. Sometimes commodity producers don't have enough capacity or resources to cater to the demand of the market. Therefore, they outsource the production of commodity products. So this is not the correct choice. Let's see what we have in option B, non-essential. There are no secret recipes for non-essential products too. Therefore, non-essential goods can be outsourced as well without any risk. Option C, integral. Integral design is the one in which all the components are designed to work together in one specific product. Therefore, they have a competitive edge due to, due to their secret recipe. For example, Apple computers or phones have an integral design. If you will outsource the production of a product that has an integral design, then there is a risk that third party manufacturer will copy the core design of the product and introduce his own brand. Similar examples are Coke, Pepsi, Mirinda, etc. If you will outsource the production of these beverages third, to third party producers will get to know the formula and start producing their own fizzy drinks. A product with an integral design should not be outsourced. Therefore, this is the correct answer for this question. Let's have a look at option D as well. Option D, modular. Modular design is a product design in which you can put together different components of a product to create variety of other similar products like IKEA furniture, modular bookshelves, computer RAMs, etc. There is no harm in outsourcing the production of modular product components or whole product since there is not no secret recipe involved. Consider an example of an IKEA furniture. Anybody can copy the design of their furniture. There is no secret recipe in there. So option C, integral design is the correct answer for this question. Question 10. 
what is an organization's next step in a make versus buy analysis after they have determined that they do not have texting based customer service as a core competency option a outsource texting based customer service option b develop texting based customer service as a core competency option c determine if there is a need for testing for texting in customer service option d determine the consequence of losing customer service expertise if it is outsourced now before we begin i want to share a general rule of decision making especially when you encounter any problem or issue or if you have to take any decision the first and most basic step is to analyze the situation now let's evaluate all the options and see which option follows this general rule of analyzing the situation option a says outsourcing texting based customer service well this is an action that requires an investment therefore we will avoid it let's see what we have in option b develop texting based customer service as a core competency again this is an action therefore it should not be pursued you can't take such decisions as the at the spur of a moment since they require huge investment option c determine if there is a need for texting in customer service well this is the most appropriate answer as i suggested earlier that the first thing you should do when you encounter a problem or you have to make a decision is to analyze the situation and find out if there is a need to perform this task or not in other words determine if there is a need of testing a texting based service in a customer service so this is the most appropriate choice for this question let's just have a look at option d as well option d says determine the consequences of losing customers service expertise if it is outsourced we don't need to find out the consequences of losing customer service expertise since we are not willing to outsource it as yet at as yet we are determining if we need the customers if we need the service or not therefore this is not the right uh, choice too option c determine if there is a need for test texting service in customer service is the right answer for this question thank you very much for watching the video if you have any questions please comment down below and i'll try to answer as soon as i can and don't forget to click the like button thank you